I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. The career marketplace looks nothing like it did five years ago. I've written about this constantly. Today, there is a broader set of career options and even more opportunity to work that actually inspires us. That's why Catherine Minshew and Alexandra Cavalucas, co-founders of TheMuse.com, wrote The New Rules of Work. Whether you're just starting out in your career, navigating a mid-career shift, or somewhere in between, this is the book you need to thrive in the new world of work. Pick up a copy of The New Rules of Work, the modern playbook for navigating your career today. Today's episode is brought to you by Casper Mattresses. The Casper Mattress is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Supportive memory foams create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash james and using offer code james. Terms and conditions apply. Today on the James Altucher Show. Fear of making a mistake almost guarantees your mistake. Why is that? Uh, because, you know, it, it paralyzes you. It's a it's, it's, um, game of chess. Is a game of choices, so you have to make decisions. How can you kind of um, hypnotize yourself in daily life to uh, to avoid this fear? Uh, no, look, I think fear is always with us. This, this is I don't believe when some you know people say, "Oh, you know, this man, this woman, they don't have fear." We all do have our fears. The question is how we can handle it. In the cases where you don't have a clear preference, you know, you go with your sort of natural instincts. I want to do a brief intro here. This is, um, you know, I've done several hundred podcasts with all sorts of people. But if people ask me over the past several years, who is the number one or two person you would absolutely love to have on the podcast is Gary Kasparov, former world. You, you were like number one in the world in chess for, for 20 some 20 years, years yes. and world champion for, for most of that. Uh, I've been following your career since 
I don't know, 1982, read your... What is that generation? Read, read Fighting Chess. I'm 2200 rated, so I always was wow. keeping track of it. Not, <laughs> not you. I, I'm well, a gnat. Uh, I'm an ant on that's... the floor compared to you. But world chess champion for so many years, and you were for uh, a while the, the coach of the current world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen. Now, you wrote this your latest book, Deep Thinking. For the first time, you wrote about this famous, or I would say infamous, match from 20 years ago. Two matches. 96, two 97. Matches, two matches. Deep Blue versus you. It was the first time uh, a computer, and this one was owned by IBM, first time a computer beat the world chess champion in a match. And ever since the computer was invented, it was kind of considered iconic that if a computer could beat chess... Kind of a holy chess, grail. Holy yeah, grail. <laughs> yeah, it was the holy grail. If a computer could beat the world champion in chess, then there's AI. And you were there. You were you were the world champion at the time. I was the holy grail. <laughs> you, were, you were the holy grail. And I want to say, I was in the audience for that match in 1997. And in 1989, I was you office mates. You also watched the match in 1989 when I played with this team? I was, I was office mates with Feng Shu. Ah, so I, was, ah. I, I played on Chip Test before it was renamed Deep Thought. Yeah. And I would play against openings, you know, and, and wow. on, on ah. Chip Test. So, so I know all about from beginning to... I, IBM offered me a job to work on Deep Blue. And, wow. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know why I turned it? I turned it down because of a girl. I stayed in Pittsburgh. Big mistake. I should have worked on Deep Blue <laughs> and been part of the team that, that won. But this book was so interesting. Why'd you write it now, 20 years later? Oh, I mean, let's not mislead, you know, our listeners, you know, it's not just about Kaspar versus Deep Blue, you know, um, it's about, you know, history of what I believe the most important relations of the 21st century, humans and machines. And um, chess, you know, you, you were right, saying that from the very beginning of computer science, chess was seen by, you know, giants uh, uh, and legends as uh, uh, like Alan Turing and, and Claude Shannon as the, you know, as the ultimate test. Yeah. If machine solves this test, means beating the world champion, that's a proof of artificial intelligence. Okay, who am I to criticize them, but they were wrong. Machine won this match, but it's, it was as intelligent as your alarm clock. Well, well, that's just Ten, it. $10 million alarm clock, but still, you know. It, but that's just it. Everything, everything is sort of AI until it's done, and then they realize, yeah, oh, that's the, not real yeah, intelligence. But it, it, we, you know, we can spend a lot of time, you know, discussing the semantics, you know, what is artificial intelligence, you know. D does it mean that we have to, you know, replicate the process in human brains, or we should look simply at the result? And if machine reaches this result, you know, is it artificial intelligence by definition? Or, you know, it's still, you know, um, it's still a big gap between the way the humans making decisions, you know, the rich conclusions and machines, you know, okay, achieving somehow similar results. Well, well, I want to I wanna reel back just one second about your career itself. So, obviously, you weren't born world champion. It, it took work. And I'm very interested in just... Uh, peak performance and what got you to this point where you were the Holy Grail. So, so you were born obviously s talented, and your talent was recognized and early, you, 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 very early on. Um, but what then separated you out from, let's say, your your peers who may have been just as talented? Like, what do you like? Just what would no, you look, say? Wait, are the wait, steps wait, wait, to... wait, 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 slow down. I mean, is, you know, as talented is probably it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stretch. <laughs> no, I get. I was I was lucky. You know, I was born. In a family uh, uh, where you know chess uh, was kind of part of culture, so uh -huh. my father and my mother they they usually spend their their, their winter nights you know looking at the newspaper uh, chess sections you know solving problems. So a uh, few other relatives you know they play chess again at amateur's level, but chess was there as in many in, you know um, intelligent families uh, in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, I was born in the Soviet Union. So when the talent was discovered, you know, I had an opportunity sort of to learn, you know, uh, to be taught by, you know, semi-professionals, then professionals. So the, the, the framework for, for my talent to be discovered and, and, and uh, uh, to be polished, you know, was there. Uh, so that's, that's, you may call luck. Uh, but um, the talent was quite unique, you know. So uh, uh, since you know, I uh, since I discovered chess, you know, I moved very quickly, you know, just you know, beating you know not only you know kids of my age but you know older age. And by age twelve, I was already the Soviet junior champion under eighteen. Hmm. So um, you know, it was very natural for for all people who helped me. Starting, of course, with my mother. My father died when I was seven, but my mother spent her entire life, you know, helping helping me and and, and making sure that you know my talent uh, uh, will uh, 
uh, will um, help me to 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 reach the uh, to reach the the very top of the world of chess. So, and so not only in chess, of course. So so, so would you say so so then um, I guess. She or the environment introduced you to Mikhail Botvinnik, who was a former world champion. Yeah, it, and you yeah went it's, to his it's, a, it's a part. It's a part of the of the uh, Soviet chess system. So um, uh, the, people believe, and it's they're, they're wrong in believing that chess was a part of the education of the Soviet Union. Actually, it was never part of education. Uh, that's what I, I've been trying to accomplish. You know, after I became the world champion, I've been doing it now around the world. But in the Soviet Union, chess was viewed as a very important ideological tool to demonstrate, uh, um, to display the intellectual superiority of communist system over decadent West. So that's why, you know, um, there was a very sophisticated network uh, of searching for young talents. And when the talent is found, to make sure that this talent will not be wasted and will be given proper attention to, you know, just to go as high as possible. So at age 10, um, when I played for um, the team of my uh, Native Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, at the first uh, um, all Soviet uh, youth games, and I was ten, and I played at, uh, at um, with with boys that were uh, fourteen and fifteen years old, and I did fairly well, and uh, I was noticed and uh, invited to Botvinnik School, and then again my progress was fast, and uh, at every level I received certain attention that was required. That's why you know I could I could make this you know, this fast progress. Without wasting time, you know, for you know, searching uh, uh, while searching for uh, uh, specific assistance. So, so, but there was not just a talent at chess. There was also a talent at. I mean, you were also known as like one of the most prepared. Uh, yeah, but that's, world that's, champions that's, that's ever. More, that's more about the style, you know. Mm-hmm. It's just I had an appetite for for analyzing, you know, chess games and looking deeply in the in opening positions, and of course, working with uh, with my great mentor Mikhail Batvinik, the the former world chess champion who, who was a scientist. You know, some chess players, they're artists. Some of them are scientists. Some of them are just, you know, just playing for sports. So some of them are, you know, a combination of all these factors. But but Vinik was predominantly a scientist. And it uh, it helped me to actually to uh, sharpen my analytical skills. And uh, I I had appetite, even now, you know, just age 54, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've retired for more than 10 years. I still have an interest, you know, just analyzing the games, looking at, you know, other games played by top players and, you know, just always looking for, you know, some revelations. So uh, I just want to ask, is it true uh, Bodvinik once trained by having, playing a match with someone smoking into his face? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the story, yes. It's the Batvinik. Batvinik played at a time, you know, just in, in 30s, 40s and 50s and early 60s, you know, when, you know, the, the smoking was loud, you know, and this is the audience uh, could, could could get very, you know, excited. It could be a lot of noise. And again, this is part of Batvinik's, you know, uh, Batvinik's preparation. He wanted to be prepared for every surprise, not only at the chessboard, but also around the chessboard. And one of the problems was that, you know, the, his opponent could, could smoke, could smoke. And uh, he wanted his his uh, assistant who worked with him and played his training games, another grandmaster, not just to smoke, but also to have a very loud music. So to, he wanted to have as much disturbance as possible throughout the, uh, the, the tra- training process to make sure that at the crucial moment when you have to make the, the, the vital decision that could decide the game or, or maybe, maybe the whole match, uh, he, will be, um, yeah, he will be well prepared and he will not be... Um, um, and you'll be undeterred. So it, it, it reminds me of things you write about in this book. Uh, so, you, so your recent book, Deep Thinking, about the, the match. But really, it, it reminds me of what you... Uh, when you describe the games, you don't just describe the games. You seem to also describe the whole environment around the match. So so what is a computer? How do you play against a computer? But you didn't. that's not the first time you've done that, obviously. Your first world championship match against Karpov was very much... I have to ask about this. You were down what four zero five zero, and then you started this ingenious strategy of just drawing every game. And what was? How did you consciously shift gears at that point? And you were you were a young guy. You were twenty two years old. How did you consciously shift gears? And were you scared of what was going to happen? Like what? What was going oh, through your man. mind? No, it's uh, it's you may call it you know survival instinct. Uh, you know, uh, you start a match, you know, I was actually 21 when I started playing. Um, I was, of course, very arrogant. You know, I believed I had to win. I I was 
at that time, probably as good as Karpov. But you know, being as good as the world champion is not enough because you have to beat the world champion. And I, I lack experience of playing the world championship matches. It's a different aura, you know. There's a lot of pressure. So that's why you know, early in the match, you know, I played very poorly. When I just looked at the games later, you know, I was horrified by mistakes I made because let's say game six, you know, I would have probably won the game, you know, finding this winning combination because it was my eyes closed, you know. But at the board, you know, when you have all this pressure, you know, and just you look at these, these options, you know, the clock is ticking, you know, it's, you know, it's mistake after mistake, you know. And Karpov was either very good, you know, he was, you know, um, you may call him like, you know, the cleaner, you know, he just every mistake, he just grabbed, you know, he grabbed all these chances. I've been throwing them, you know, you know right, left, and the center. And Karpov was very good in picking them up. So, you know, after game nine, it was a 4 0, and I just realized, you know, just two more, two more. Bad days, you know, because the match was played until till, one, till six. Till, yes, until one one player, you know, or would have won six games. So, I mean, what could I do? You know, just uh, uh, either you know, you could just try to, uh, to to rush. You know, let's die. You know, as a hero, but just you know, maybe win another game. But I thought, why why not? You know, I mean, let let Carpo win. You know, why should I rush? You know, why should I? You know, open up. You know, when you attack, you know, obviously you offer more opportunities for your opponent to 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 for counter punch. Um, and also, I I could play the match uh, as long as I I I, I could uh, by uh, by making draws, but also learning because it's 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 a learning it's a learning exercise. And I thought, well, I'm 21, you know, so if, even if I lose now, I come back three years later. At that, that time, the cycle was three right. years. But I could have this precious experience. But also, let you know, let, let him win. And well, but think, that's like an unusual strat in your career at that point. Absolutely unusual. That was like the first but, time you've ever done but that. But that's 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 about sort of, you know that's you know that actually what you know um, uh, built my character. So mm. again, all the components were there, but we all need a test. You know, an ultimate test. You know, you're facing you know this unsurmountable challenge, and uh, the question is how. Uh, question is how you you can. Um, meet this challenge and how can you survive you know in this impossible situation and uh, I'm it, it's it helped me many more times later on because every time I faced a new challenge every time I thought yeah it's just it's impossible to overcome I said okay what could be worse than 5-0 because it's, if, if you look at the odds you know my odds to win the match to survive or, you know, I don't know, microscopic, you know, this is, this right. is, it's, it's a against the world champion. Like, it wasn't just exactly, any player. Yeah, this, no, 5 0, he, because eventually Carpo won one more game. Yeah, and it's, and uh, it's, it, it was just, you know, all lost, you know, so it's the, I don't know the odds, you know, one to quadrillion. So, it's, but I, you know, um, I survived and I, you know, I, I could feel during the match that, you know, with every game, you know, I was adding a little bit of confidence, you know, learning. And, you could also feel because when you spend so much time with someone, you know, just across the board, you can feel your opponent's reactions. Carpo was getting nervous. You know, it's okay. He was, you know, he was started playing in September. By the beginning of October, he was 4 0. October ends. November, he eventually, by the end of November, he got to 5 0. But then December, I won one game. Then January, and, and I'm still there. And he's still there. And he's getting nervous. And, and the Soviet authorities, they were quite upset because we were. He we, sort of represented them in yeah, some sense. Yeah, but it's also, we, we were playing in one of, the, one of the most important halls in the Soviet Union, you know, mm. the halls of Kalm, in, in the center of Moscow. And, you know, they didn't expect the match to go for so long because they, they were, it, the hall was needed for other, other you know, mm. um, ceremonies. By the way, some of the, you know, some of the members of uh, Octogenetic Politburo, they began to die and they, 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 they closed it, you know, once for the Minister of Defense, you know, who had to be, you know, uh, the ceremony there, you know, when, you know, just uh, when he died. So, and, and uh, Karpov promised that he would finish the match, uh, you know, at, Next day, next next week, but it went on and on and on. And at the end of January, you know, Carpo lost his patience. He made, you know, just did a push too hard, and I won game two. Then they were, we were kicked out from Hall of Columns, moved to another hotel in the suburbs of Moscow, and then I won game three. So, which was still, you know, five three. You know, if you look at the odds, still probably in Carpo's favor. But considering the fact that he could win a game for three months, he was nervous. You know, how probably, many draws in a row were that? Oh, we were forty draws. That's so unbelievable. It's just, you know, we played for six months. And I, you know, I I was quite excited because, look, you know, I had a chance, you know, 5-3 is still a long way to go, but I just won, you know, two more games, you know, in, in, in within one week. 
and uh, and Karpov, you know, he looked psychologically exhausted because you know he just couldn't he couldn't contemplate you know why on, on earth you know he's still there I'm still there and he couldn't win the match and then the Soviet authorities decided it's time to actually stop it you know and then started again in in September it was just a lot of you know maneuvering back and forth I think I was on the verge of disqualification for my you know for my um, statements I was outspoken criticizing them but then again I was lucky remember I said I was lucky I was born in the Soviet Union you know and I got you know all this attention that I needed you know as a talented player but then uh, it was Gorbachev perestroika you know so this and eventually you know this is the the all this conspiracy just you know to p- defend Karpov out of the chessboard failed and I remember you know well after meeting one of the top uh, authorities, you know, in the, com- in, in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, uh, in August 1985, I came back to our residence in Moscow. I said, "Mom, mom, great news! Now I can beat Karpov. Then let me win the match." So basically, I said, "It's it's 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 not for us to inter- to interfere. You play the match. You know who wins. That's it. You know that's so be." They actually told you that. Yeah, yeah. That's told me that that's that's no longer you know the interest of the of the of the um, Politburo of the Communist Party. We are both Soviets. Uh, Still, you know, Karpov had a lot of support, even in 86, as uh, when we played the rematch, and even in 87, because, you know, he had so, you know, um, such a deep-rooted support among KGB and, and Soviet authorities. But, you know, I, I I was already a world champion after I won in 85, and I could, you know, um, I mean, I could afford more than was uh, that 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 uh, would be allowed for an ordinary Soviet citizen. So, so but, but doing 40 draws in a row against uh, who was then, the guy who was then the world champion... That's not an easy thing to do either. Like, how do you kind of put yourself into a mindset? Okay, I'm just not going to try for it. I'm going to go for a draw. No, but it's yeah. You play safely. You know, again, it's the it's something that inside of you. It's either you can do it or you cannot do it. But it's you have to survive. You know, and trust me, when you have to survive, you know, you can discover a lot of you know things that you 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 didn't know about yourself. So it's just, and I. Uh, what did you I, discover then? I discovered that you know I could adjust. You know, mm-hmm. this is that's about you know. Um, um, uh, it's about evolution, you know. It's the, it's. Uh, I think people, you know, they, they, they often misunderstand, you know, the the concept of of evolution theory. This is not about the strongest species to survive, not the smartest species to survive, but the most adaptable to change. Mm. So you have to adapt, you know. There's no other choice, you know, or you die. So in this case, you die as a chess. Right. Player, you know, you will not win the match, and then you will be kicked, you know, uh, uh, back to the candidate cycle. And of course, if you lose six to nothing, you know, that will be, you know, bleeding, bleeding wound, you know, embarrassing. So you have to, you know, defend your chess owner. You have to defend your your integrity as the as as a great chess player, and you know, you have to adjust. Period. And I did it, and I I said I. I learned a lot about myself and about my ability to adjust. And I also, I would point out that you know, in two years later. Uh, when we played another match, the the the, the fourth match, because I the, the, we're talking about the first one, then we played the second. I won the second match. Actually, the, in the last game, game twenty four, because no more unlimited matches. They they already limited with twenty four games. Um, I was uh, Karp was trailing me one point twelve to eleven, and he had to win the last game. And then in case of tie, you know, the world champion, you know, retained the title, and he failed. He lost the game. Mm. In 87, it, the roles were reversed, you know. I was trailing because I made a terrible mistake in game 23. I lost it. And I was trailing one point. I had to win the game to retain the title. And I did it. And again, it's the, it, was, it was a pure psychology. Karpo in Moscow tried to attack, you know, because it's one game. He played with white pieces. He had to attack. He tried very hard. But, you know, I defended and eventually, you know, counterattacked and won. Now, I had a totally different strategy. I thought, oh, maybe my best chance because it's, it's up to... 10 weeks of playing, you know, you have one game, you have to win, you know, uh, otherwise, again, you you, 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 you lose everything that you gain over these years. What can you do with Karpov? So he expects you to rush, to attack you. So why don't you play slowly, you know, just, and just keeping, keep, keep, keep going, you know, just uh, because he's, you, you want crisis and you don't give him this, this, this pleasure, you know, the crisis is being postponed, protracted, you know, and, and he, he was looking for some kind of, you know, simplification. And he just, you know, exchanged one piece and positions was getting a little bit worse. So he has been trying to force a draw. In, it's not me trying to force a win, but he's trying to force a draw, which, you know, oh, you always make concessions because you just, you, you're, you're in a rush. And eventually, you know, he, um, he gave me a good winning chance. I missed the chance, but in the time trouble, he missed the chance. The game was adjourned and it was a 50-50 call. But again, he failed to defend position, which probably was defendable. But I remember, you know, when 
because at that time we had a Germans, Adjour- you know, we, we adjourned the game, we played the next day. I had an end game with one extra pawn, but as I said, you know, it was defendable. And um, and I remember I was there at stage you know, a couple of minutes earlier, and then Carpo walked in, and I looked at his face, and I knew already, because we played so many games, I knew already looking at his eyes that he, he didn't believe he could save the game. Mm. So just, you know, it, it, you know he, he was doomed. You know, it was, it was written all over his face. So I, I always wonder about this in, in every field, like chess, tennis, golf. The difference between number one and let's say number 20 is how much of that is psychology? Because obviously anyone who's 20th in the world is an incredible player in their field. Um, but, but what you described there, you described the whole match in terms of psychology, or not the whole thing, but a lot of it. Yeah, but we're talking about psychology of, between the two world champions. Right. Of players of the same status. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were some great players in, in, in chess history that were so close but never made it. But, you know, um, I... I wouldn't. I wouldn't even have this. 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 This uh, uh, drawing line. You know, between one and twenty. I would say it's probably. It could be between one and five. One and five. So this. It's. 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 it's it seems that it's so close. But now just look at the current. You know, the uh, ranking in the world of chess is Magnus Carlsen, and then you look at, at at the generation of players that's of his age or older. He's just he's totally dominant. The only threat comes from, you know, from a younger player. So I would say it's uh, uh, Fabiano Carana or Wesley Saw. So this is the two younger players. And it's, and it's, it's still not clear whether they can beat him. I think there's, there's a chance. But you can see that it's this, the world champion is just, it's more than just, you know, it's the first among equals. You know, the, somebody who is there, you know, and there were only 16 world champions. We had the, you know, the, uh, the longest uh, recorded history of the official title among any other sports since 1886. And there were only 16 world champions. That tells you that it's, it's, the title is more than just winning one, one match, you know, even one tournament. The title is, is about bringing something new into the game of chess. You can look at every of these world champions. And I wrote about my great predecessors, about 12 great world books, champions. by bef- the way. Yeah, yes, 12 world champions uh, before me. Um, and I wrote about my, all my matches with Karpov. And I haven't, I haven't written anything about, you know, uh, my uh, successors, you know, like Vladimir Kramnik, Vichy Anand, and, and Magnus Carlsen. But each of the 16 players brought something unique. It's about, you know, expanding the horizons. It's, it's making game richer. And, and by the way, you know, playing very much, you know, um, according to sort of the... To the um, sort of cultural, scientific, social demands of the day. When you look at the playing styles of the world champions, you can always find similarities with the, with the most sort of powerful and dominant uh, 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 trait of, the, um, uh, um, uh, of um, the modern life. Well, well and, and this will segue into the deep blue versus you, but I remember uh, when you were when you first became world champion, what you seemed, the the narrative of that story was Karpov sort of, he was very slow positional style. Like you said, he would accumulate small advantages, but it seemed like he would be compared to kind of the octogenarian, you know, Soviet Union. And there was, there was you kind of fighting, you know, you sort of represented the Gorbachev side. Let's, 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 let's let's separate, you know, political from, you know, uh, 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 political preferences and affiliation with the chess style. Uh, Magnus Carlsen is, you know, he's much closer as a chess player to Anatoly Karpov. So mm-hmm. when you look at the style, and uh, that's why our cooperation with him was so successful. So for Magnus, I spent more than a year with him when he was just, you know, just about to make this sort of the final jump, you know, uh, um, uh, leap uh, forward, you know, just to, uh, he was number four or five, you know, close just to become number one. And uh, what helped, you know, um, him and what was wh- why this cooperation was so productive is that he could learn from a player that had a totally different view uh, of 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 the game of chess. So just it's like I looked from a different angle. He could learn from uh, not from Karpov, who could be you know similar to the way he thought Magnus Carlsen, but from Gary Kasparov, who you know looked at the position and always had a, a sort of different idea how you can like what's a type of different idea like like broadly no, it's, uh broadly described is that, you know is this is it's in in most of the positions in chess you know it's you have to make a decision based very much on your preferences you know it's the, it's, it's not forced win or forced draw you just have to make a decision and uh, and it could you know change the nature of the position so that's why you know if you look at you know position from you know carp of eyes you know you'll say okay maybe i should go for you know 
no risk, but for the tiny, you know, tiny advantage, I could improve my pieces, you know. And then, you know, ten years late, ten moves later, uh, uh, in 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 the late middle game or even an end game, that could, you know, bring me some considerable advantage. Now, if you look from you know my perspective, say okay. Uh, maybe I should take a big risk, but maybe I should go with, you know, with, with the sort of big machete, you know, so just attacking immediately. By the way, it doesn't mean that players like Carpo will not attack or I will not look for, you know, small advantages to be accumulated. But it's just in, 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 it's, it's in, in cases where you don't have a clear preference, you know, you go with your sort of natural instincts. Because you always try to create position, and that's, yeah, by the way, it's, that what, you know, connects us, you know, to, to, to the computer matches. It's, it's the, um, the way we play, you know, it's the, um, we always, you know, uh, if you have to, two top players, two world champions playing each other, the winner will be the player who succeeds in forcing his opponent to play the game, which is, you know, more, more of, of his kind. That's why I lost to Vladimir Kramnik in the year 2000. I was as good as Kramnik, you know, in, 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 in the years after, after my defeat, we played. He never won a single game against me. You stayed me. number one in the world yeah, in rankings. Yeah, I stayed number one in the world in ranking. But, you know, in the match, you know, I pushed too hard, you know, just, you know, trying to actually, you know, uh, um, refute some of the ideas that Kramnik brought in. By the way, extremely, you know, uh, um, fertile ideas that are now, now dominating the opening theory, for instance, modern chess. Mm. Instead of you know just you know changing changing the the, the, the gear, so I uh, Kramnik was more flexible. So I was well prepared on ninety percent of territory, but he found this ten percent you know little island you know, and I you know okay you may call it stupidly, but it's probably arrogant. I wanted just to actually d to demonstrate that I could actually beat him at this at this you know tiny piece of territory instead of trying to actually drag him into sort of the um into the wilds. So 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 this does segue into the deep blue match because. That was very much a match where Deep Blue, just in its hardware, could, could outplay you at your the best version of your game, the tactical side, the fighting side of your game. Like you, you were nervous about getting into a, a highly tactical affair with it when, the, even though that was your style, oh, absolutely, it, it forced you to play a different a, style. It's a very, it's a, it's, it's a very important, very important observation. So I just for for the audience to understand that you know, uh, I was you know. I was at disadvantage because my favorite style, you know, was not, you know, a, the right approach against the computer. So against the computer, you have to play what they call anti-computer chess, which means, you know, being a defensive, you know, actually waiting for a machine to attack to create weakness and then to counterattack. That's not exactly, you know, how Gary Kasparov played his his best games. Uh, but but before we move into the match, again, I want to emphasize that the the book is not just about the match. This is the it's probably you know um, it's a hook. For the audience, you sure. know, uh, also obviously the publisher liked the idea that the book will be released at the day, uh, the twentieth anniversary of the day when the second match was was uh, um, uh, open in New York in in, in nineteen ninety seven. It's May second, but uh, um, you know, um, I wanted also in the book to um, um, to dismantle the mythology around the man and machine and about artificial intelligence because now all we hear is either some utopian views, oh, fantastic, phenomenal, blah, blah, blah. it just, you know, it's it's all going to be great. But more likely now we hear these dystopian views, you know, it's just coming from great minds like, you know, Stephen Hawking or great inventors and, and doers as Elon Musk. Oh, right, it's, it's almost it's, disturbing it's, what they're saying, but go ahead. But Sorry. exactly, this is, and it's, and it's, it, 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 um, uh, it's, it connects to people's minds because of, you know, we're a generation of that, that grew up with Terminator. Now the next generation grew up with, with the Matrix. It's all about the horrors of artificial intelligence actually, you know, stealing, you know, everything from us and stealing our world from us. And, um, and I tried to also, also to, uh, in the book, to, um, to explain the things in, in a very simple language because some great books like, you know, Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom, but they are they're very sophisticated, so it's very hard to read. So I try to come up with a story that has a personal, you know, uh, component, big personal component, but also it's in, in a language where, you know, which helps people to understand, look, it's not something un uncommon. The entire history of human race is inventing machines that are stealing our jobs. But for millennials, uh, okay, centuries and last decades, we saw machines, you know, getting more and more intelligent, but still, you know, taking over jobs from, you know, blue collar workers. Now, now they're going after white collar workers and after people, you know, with Twitter accounts. So now we say, oh, wow, this is, this, it threatens the world. No, it's, this is the way the, the progress works, you know, 
machines, you know, getting more intelligent, thanks to our, you know, our creativity, which makes us in turn more creative because we have to come up with something new. So it's a new cycle. But because now it, it attacks, you know, intelligence, you know, like human brains, it seems, oh, it's, 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 it's a game changer. No, it is not. It's just, you know, it's, it's like a spiral, you know, it's, a, it's the same season, but again, it's at, on a higher, you know, level of the spiral. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I said it before, I'm going to say it again. The career marketplace is totally different now than it was five years ago. In the olden days, which is just whether it's five years ago or 50 years ago, a job was at best a means to a paycheck for the vast majority of people. But today's career trajectories don't look that way. Technology has given rise to new positions that have never before existed. It's like the science fiction has come true, which means we're choosing now from a much broader set of career options than ever before and have even more opportunities to find work that actually inspires us. Do you have the tools to compete in this new world of work? Well, in the book, The New Rules of Work, The Modern Playbook for Navigating Your Career by Catherine Minshew and Alexandra Kavaloukas, Co-founders of the popular career website, themuse.com, show you how to play the game by the new rules. Through quick exercises and structured tips, you will learn how to find the right path, land the perfect job, and advance in your career. Whether you're just starting out in your career, navigating a mid-career shift, or somewhere in between, and I have to say, I am always somewhere in between, this is the book you need to thrive in the new world of work. Pick up a copy of The New Rules of Work, the modern playbook for navigating your career today. I am so happy Casper Mattresses sponsors this podcast. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Supportive memory foams create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Plus, it's breathable design, sleeps cool to help you regulate your temperature throughout the night. Buying a Casper mattress is completely risk-free. Casper offers free delivery and free returns with a 100-night home trial. How do you even offer that? If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. Free shipping and returns to U.S. and Canada. Get $50 towards any mattress purchased by visiting www.casper.com slash James and using offer code James. Terms and conditions apply. A very simple example, uh, and, and this doesn't involve AI at all, but it does involve automation, is ATM machines. Everyone thought bank tellers would go away and bank, b- bank branches would go away. But in fact, because of ATM machines, it became cheaper to build a new bank branch. So now there's more bank tellers and bank workers than ever. Exactly. This is so that in the book I talked about, you know, about uh, the elevators, you know, they, this, this, the, there was a union. 17,000 operators exactly, you mentioned. But, and, you know, but then, you know, people were, by the way, scared, you know, they were scared of, you know, of, uh, of elevators, aut- automated elevators that were available, by the way, from the beginning of the 20th century. Mm. But people still preferred, you know, someone to operate the elevator as now they're afraid of driverless cars. Yeah, uh, then it, what it took, you know, a, a strike in New York City, you know, that's, and then, you know, if, when you have to, you know, uh, go all the way up to the Empire State Building, because of an elevator, you understand, maybe, you know, you should, you should, you should uh, 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 overcome your fear and push the button, you know, right. so the elev- the, these jobs disappear, okay, some of them, you know, in, 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 in concierge, uh, they're still working, but it's, 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 a, it's a tiny drop of what it was before, uh, and, uh, um, and I think it's again, it's this is a normal development of of technology. Uh, if if we have something really breakthrough, something very disruptive, it means it kills jobs before it creates new jobs. But now people are not happy because they want you know new jobs to be created, old jobs to be kept. Sorry, it's not going to be this way. So that's the that's the way capitalism works. You know, that's the way the the free market works. You know, you come up with new disruptive ideas, and you know you make many industries redundant. So, so hypothetically, how do you but see new, it play new jobs out? are being created because they're just it's a problem who is going to take these new jobs you know? right and so 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 let's take self driving cars as an example, so people theorize it could be up to ninety percent of the auto industry just completely gone once there's self driving cars out there. How do you see it play out so that eventually those jobs kind of find their homes elsewhere 
The answer is, I don't know. And that's good news. I don't know. That's the, that means disruptive. That mm. means breakthrough. We all know. It's as if we knew, you know, it would not be, it would not be disruptive. So that means that, you know, we have to get creative. You know, we have so many things that we drop because it's too risky. Maybe we have to start, you know, space exploration. Maybe we have to look, you know, under, you know, underwater, you know, deep, deep water exploration. There's so many things we stopped in 60s and 70s because we said, oh, maybe it's too risky. Maybe we just, you know, we can, we can be happy with, 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 you know, small, you know, incremental improvements. Because when we look at the, at the technology that we're using today, it's, Okay, it's it very it's very it's very convenient, you know. It's it's very handy, but iPhone Seven is not Apollo Seven, you know. It's the all our devices they're getting thinner, you know, shinier, lighter. But this is it's not breakthrough. So we 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 will be facing, you know, the the same challenges that people hundred years ago. So when when they just saw this the the industrial revolution, you know, changing changing the face of the world. Well, you can argue. Um uh, the internet, even though it wasn't necessarily a technological huge innovation, it did. It was a social innovation that, uh, combined with no, technology. By the way, it was. It was. This, the problem is people believe it was invented in 1989, though the, so the foundation of the internet. In, no, excuse me, in the 60s. It was a part of the DARPA project. And in 1962, Leonard Kleiner came up uh, with um, you know, uh, packet switching uh, theory. And in 1963, the scientists of, of DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency that's uh, working for U.S. government. They came up with a full description of internet, including Skype, voice mm. over IP. You know, mm. it is. It was all described by Dr. Joseph Licklider in his. It was in in um, in um, uh, his concept of intergalactic. <laughs> Sick intergalactic. You know, just I emphasize it. Computer network. I like how they think in these science fiction terms back then. But that's but <laughs> that's that's how they made things work, you know. I I you know, I had the privilege of 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 um, meeting and then speaking to to uh, to Professor Kleinrock, and I asked him how come that you were you know you were just not even thirty in 1962. He came up with this you know concept of machines talking to machines, you know, uh, just packet switching. And he said, you know, I was a big you know fan of of Nikola Tesla. And I, I had a dream. He said, uh, I had a dream to make machines talking to each other. That's you know that's what we are missing today you know that's 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 why and I just I, I want people to not to be afraid of this progress because there's so many things we can bring back if we start dreaming again by the way machines cannot dream even in the sleeping mode well and I think that's a big confusion too with AI is that they conflate computer achievements with human intelligence when they're not related at all like again the way a computer was able to beat you was not by giving it human intelligence but 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 improving the hardware to such a point that it could calculate as fast as potentially you could. Uh, look, okay, uh, it's the regarding the match in in and seven. And I always want to emphasize that in ninety six I won the match. The first match we played, I won. Then I made a huge improvement. I agree, and uh, and I'm very complimentary about the the, the the accomplishment. I'm highly critical of the way corporation run the match because IBM was an organizer, you know, the right. referee just, and obviously, you know, certain things they did during the match they. They had, you know, they had an effect, negative effect on on Gary Kaspar as, as as a human being, you know, just you know, you because if you are you know losing self control, if you are nervous, you know, then you are vulnerable. And playing against the machine, you know, if you are vulnerable, you're dead. So that's that's every mistake would punish. Um, Twenty years later, I spent a lot of time analyze the games, you know. Now it's, it's to be objective, you know. That's the I played the match very poorly, you know, way under my ability to play a match at that time. I was not well prepared. I was wrong in my, you know, anticipation of Deep Blue strengths. I have to admit that they made much bigger progress than I, I expected. Uh, but still, you know, I think that if we played another match, the, the rubber match, I would have won. Hmm. In that, it doesn't mean that, you know, it could change, you know, sort of the, the, the tide of history. It's, it was already writing on the wall. So right. this is, and by the way, you know, I lost the game one of 1996 match. And, and we may say that's, you know, that's as important as me losing the match in 1997 because machine could have won, you know, one game. Uh, it, it, right. it has won the one. And that's enough, you know. It's winning one game means eventually it will win, you know, more than one game and it will win the match. And in the next few, few years after 1997, there were, there were other matches. Vladimir Kramnik played. I played other matches. You know, until 2003, 2004, we still could compete with 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 um, other machines. They were not as powerful as the blue in hardware, but they were far more sophisticated in software. They mm. had just you know better and much much better engines. But it's it was it was like in you know, a competition, a race against time. And today, you know, in 
I'm not sure about about uh, your phone. Definitely on the iPad, but maybe on your phone you can have you know a chess engine that is as good and even stronger than than Deep Blue. Like I have a shredder on my phone. Yeah, of course, yeah. That's yeah. this. You know, uh, we. we I, I I worked with 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 my assistant and we checked you know uh, the Deep Blue games on 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 on, on um, our laptops and you could see that it's it's it's, it's just the machines they are I don't know that's just hundreds hundreds points of Elo you know stronger than than, than the, the Blue and and by the way there's there's some mistakes that you know that I couldn't even expect you know the game five which is you know interesting is as it's it's the my last chance to win the match it was two two and I I was pressing hard eventually the D blue found like a miraculous way of saving the game but when you now look at this game with a computer you just realize that it was full of mistakes from both sides and D blue made a mistake in end game it's what it had you know both sides had rook knight and 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 uh, four pawns and instead of forcing a draw as being shown by every engine today within a minute. Deep Blue spent more than a minute and made a move that was losing. Mm -hmm. So it means they you know that any computer today would have just you know uh, crashed Deep Blue in 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 this in the in in this roughly you know even end game, but it's it's a drawish in, in a drawish end game. Um, but but it, it doesn't it doesn't get it doesn't change you know the 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 uh, as you said as the um, the, impo the importance of the uh, the importance of the match since you know they won and it's just yeah I played poorly I could have done better. But it was a very important, you know, uh, step forward because it's it basically it reached a point, you know, where for Alan Turing and other, you know, giants of the past, the story was over. And we, by the way, discovered that it's not because it's well. It, there's it always new, about AI, right? And there's always new problems. Like ten years ago, facial recognition was a hard problem. Now. It's it's done. Like computers could do it. Ten years ago, Go, the game Go, was a hard problem. Now they beat the world's uh, best Go player. Go is this. Go is. I'm not an expert on Go, so that's why I, you know, you have to be, uh, uh, you have to be cautious in in in, in accepting my, uh, yeah, and any 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 of my statements. C cautious uh, caution noted. Caution, <laughs> yes. It's still, see, I, I I don't I don't have rights to speak with the same authority as 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 of the game of chess, but. All I know about Go, you know, this game is so complicated, you know, this, this, and it's, it's, it's more difficult than chess to be, to be cracked because it's not about calculation. This, it's more conceptual, but also the quality of human playing Go is much lower than that in chess. I mean, when it's much lower than the world champion in chess, you know, um, it just, you know, plays again ideal. If we look, if we look at ideal moves, he's much closer to ideal ideal uh, uh, game of chess than than a go player because in go you can have you can make mistakes. You know, since it's it's the game is so complex, um, and since the game is not as you know as um, steady as the game of the of, of 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 the world champion. So machine, which I think it's it's not as sophisticated as as a chess engines, it still you know has has an uh, upper hand because because. Um, Machines are always, you know, they 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 play sort of the level game. It's it it has a, you may call it steady hand. Mm. So that's why you know if you are playing, if your game is uneven, you know, it's ups and downs. You are very vulnerable. Uh, I don't. I think in Go, you know, the the world champion can play and you can you can keep losing. In chess, I think Magnus Carlsen was white pieces. I think he could make a draw if he wants to. Mm. So today, so so it's but, but he probably can't win. No, no, win win is win is win is. Almost impossible. I think it's just I would say ninety nine point nine percent impossible. Maybe if you give him ten chances, ten games, and tell him that it doesn't matter what happens in any game, if he he, he wins the match, if he wins one game, maybe he has a chance. Hmm. If he plays, you know, with just with with all full, you know, uh, uh, rigor, you know, just you know, and and he's not afraid of losing. So then maybe he has a chance. But there's one thing that you know that 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 prevents humans of uh, beating machines in chess. Um, um, it's a level of accuracy that re is required to win against a machine. Because even in the best games that we play in chess, you know, when I played with Karpov or Magnus Carlsen plays today with his opponents, um, you can see the, the the great games, 50 moves, 45, good quality, four great moves. There's always one inaccuracy. I'm not talking about terrible blunder, even about a mistake, inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. Which is almost unnoticed for human eye because again, okay, it's this the it's like you know gifts are returned. You know, so I make a mistake, you know, you, 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 and you return the favor. Mm -hmm. it, and also when my, when your position is is bad, 
So you, very often you're just losing your stamina. So, okay, it's a bad position. So who cares, how, how, you know, how good is your opponent in actually delivering the final blow? Not with a computer. Right. Computer doesn't care position is winning or losing. It just looks objectively at every moment and it looks for every chance to escape. So that's why one inaccuracy could throw your, you know, 49 uh, uh, good moves, you know, your six hours hard work. Uh, and it's, I think that this kind of vigilance is almost impossible for, 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 for humans. So that's why winning the game is highly unlikely. Making draws for the world champion in chess, doable. So, so you said if, if, you mentioned one thing though, you said if Magnus Carlsen is not afraid. So how, at, at that level, world championship level, how do you kind of almost, I don't want to say hypnotize yourself, but how do you kind of psych yourself up to the right persona when you're at that level of uh, playing? Now, I, I, yeah, I want to emphasize again that what I said about fear, mm. because, you know, uh, fear of making mistake almost guarantees mm. your mistake. Uh, and um, why is that? Uh, because you know it, it paralyzes you. It's 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 um, you know if you have to game of chess is a game of choices. So you have to make decisions. You know every move is a decision. Okay, in the openings you can follow the fa the famous lines. You know in the end game you can just follow the sort of the the um, end game manuals. But in the middle of the game, you know you're on your own. You have to make you know, choices, sometimes choosing between, you know, roughly even options. And it's all, it's always about risk, you know, if, especially if you want to win the game. And uh, making decisions, you know, you have to be confident that your decision is good. And if you if you fear uh, that your decision is not good, if you fear that, it, you know, you can lose the game, somehow, subconsciously, it paralyzes you. It just, it, it, it um, inflicts a damage to, to, to the decision-making process. So that's why if you can actually remove the fear, that's why I said playing machine, Say, you play, doesn't matter. You have to win one game. You, it doesn't matter if you lose nine. But just as long as you win one, you won the match. That could actually change the equation because it could, you know, uh, unleash an amazing power that is inside, but it's always being, you know, restrained by our fear. I, I kind of like this. How can, um, I almost want to have this just walking outside, at, you know, out the door and have that kind of power. How do you, how can you kind of... Um, hypnotize yourself in daily life to uh, to avoid this fear? Uh, no, look, I think fear is always with us. This, this is, it's, I don't believe when some, you know, people say, oh, yeah, this man, this woman, they don't have fear. We all do have our fears. The question is how we can handle it. Um, I don't have a special advice. So is the, I do recognize our fears, you know, especially, you know, you, you, you grow up, you have families, you have kids, you know, fear is, is just, you know, it's, it's, it's a normal element of our life. But when you play, you know, it's the, it's. At that competitive level. It's a competitive level. That, that, that's why it's impossible to play chess at my age, competitive level now, because, you know, you have so many other things, you know, that, you know, your concentration on the same, you have other problems, you have fears, you know, normally, because you grow up, you know, you have other responsibilities in your life. Well, let, let's talk about that. You, you also recently wrote an excellent book, Winter is Coming, and you, you, it, it's about uh, Putin and Russia. You've been outspoken uh, as a kind of a, I don't know how you describe it, an activist Democrat in Russia no. against against Putin and his policies and, and many other things about how Russia is one. You even tentatively ran for president of Russia uh, shortly after you re retired from chess. So, so, you know, is this more a part of your daily life now? Uh, no, my daily life, you know, is comprised of different components. So it's the, it, it's um, writing on my social about politics, uh, but other things as well. So also writing books. Um, it's also, you know, quite a significant chess component because uh, um, uh, I keep building, you know, uh, uh, and uh, um, spreading around the world, Kasparov Chess Foundation. It's a 15th anniversary that we started the first one in the United States. Uh, and I can proudly say that now uh, the U.S. junior team under 18 is, is the best in the world. Uh, surprise, surprise. It's just, you know, you, you keep working with these people. There's plenty of talent and you just find this talent and if you, you know, invest your time and resources, so you you actually reach re results similar to what was in the Soviet Union 40, 50 years ago. Um, and we have other foundations in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in, in, in Mexico. Now we just opened one in Paris, in Francophonie. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, that takes time, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to actually, you know, build my legacy in the wall of chess, you know, in it, bringing chess to education, but also creating a new rating system and uh, a network of competitions, bringing sponsors. So I'm not actively engaged as a chess player, but I think, you know, I have certain responsibilities of making it work. What do you think, um, how does chess and education in general benefit kids? Because it seems like there's many benefits. What, are, what do you see as... Uh... Uh, I think it's one of the, one of the best tools to um, so enhance the... Um, the uh, modern educational system because, you know, we live at a time when it's much less relevant what you teach kids rather than how you do it. Because, you know, if we, if we agree that education is about, you know, preparing our kids for the future life, you know, this is, and they, at age, you know, eight, nine, 10, and, 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 and as a teenagers, they have to learn something that will be useful for their lives. Now, how can we be sure that what they're l- learning today will be relevant because most of the professions and new professions that they will be seeking 15 years from now don't exist. And by the way, we even don't know what would be, you know, what would be right. the most, what would be at, at, at the demand, you know, 15 years from now, since many of the of the best paid jobs today didn't exist 50 years ago. It, it's so true. Just the other day, I saw a job, uh, a help wanted ad for a self-driving car engineer. Like five yeah, years but, ago, but that would have been a science fiction yeah, but job. 3D, but yeah, what about these 3D printers, you know? Yeah. This is the, 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 the social media managers. Again, this, most of these sort of exist, these, uh, um, uh, exciting jobs today, they, you know, they were products of 21st century. So we should just, you know, realize that it's very important to actually make kids, you know, um, uh, adjustable to these new challenges. So it, it, it's all about algorithms, about patterns, recognizing patterns, seeing the big picture. And chess is perfect. You know, it's all about your learning how the move that you make on the queen side could affect, you know, something that happens on the, on, on the king side. And also, it just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the best training for cognitive skills. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a very general thing that, you know, helps them to absorb this information and, and you know, build these patterns and bridges, connect things. It's about connectivity. So, um, and one more advantage, it's, it, an ex- it's inexpensive. You don't have to build a swimming pool, a soccer field, you know, a uh, uh, tennis court. It's, you know, it's a part of the, of, of the classroom and it, it could be connected to computers. So it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's an ideal tool and we have been very successful promoting it, you know, in, in, in the most advanced uh, uh, schools in this country or in Europe and in the most sort of desolated areas in Africa. So the, it seems also there's kind of the the meta aspects of learning something like chess like there's a discipline like how yeah. when you were young how many hours a day did you study specifically chess no, but discipline of course you know again it's, it's it's a hard work but we don't it's it's you know this is you know, we're already probably moving to the semi-professional side of that but if you talk about a social effect uh you know i can tell you that in in, in places you know that's i mentioned in africa you know uh you could see the drop of the absentee rate because kids mm. are excited, you know, they go to the school, they there's something, exactly, they play. So it's, it's, it has a social effect. Also, you know, in many places, it's, again, uh, in this country or in, in, in other, you know, um, parts of the develop, uh, developed world, it's hard to imagine that before you actually start teaching kids, whether it's in Africa or, 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 or in, in many parts of Asia or Latin America, uh, especially in Africa, where we had plenty of experience because that's one of the most you know, successful foundations, Kaspar Chess Foundations. And I personally traveled across the continent. I visited 22 African countries. Mm. So, uh, and I know we just did it's first-hand experience. You have to convince these kids that education has a value. Because here we know, it's just, it's, uh, the kid goes to school because his father, his mother, they went to school. Their, you know, uh, mothers and fathers went to school. So this is, you have already generations that, you know, that know that school is is a, is a part of the of of the of the routine. You know? Now you are talking to people that you know that's that's that that never had education as a part of the of their life. You know, so it's the most of the parents of these kids. You know, they they never attended schools, and uh, you know they God knows if they can. You know, they know how to write. So you just have to convince these kids that education has a value for them. So that's why anything that makes them excited is very important. You have to you drag them in. So you have to explain very simple things, you know, like up and down, right and left, you know, concept of center. So many things that we can do with chess, you know, as the, as a, it's a good, you know, it's, it's a colorful way of, you know, of entering the educational system. And then again, God knows what happens, but it's very important that they, they have an appetite to actually become educated. So, so you know, it, it, there's, a, there's also the aspect of having a coach or a teacher. So again, in education, there's 
there's a teacher. And you mentioned the effect you had on Magnus Carlsen. You mentioned Botvinnik's effect on you. What's the role of, like, if you never had a coach like Botvinnik or if Carlsen never had a coach like you, is there a, a cap? Like, does everybody, to reach their potential, do people need a mentor or a coach? We're talking about professional chess now. We're talking about professional, yes, professional. But, but, but in any area, really. Yeah, but in, that, in, uh, in uh, any area, to reach your potential, you know, you need your mentor. So that's, uh, it goes without saying, even at the age, you know, at the digital age, you know. Though, of course, we have to admit that today, you know, a young player can learn, you know, more about, uh, um, uh, more than Bobby Fischer ever knew about chess, you know, in, in, in a year or two by just, you know, working with computer and uh, and with this very average assistant. Uh, but in order to reach your potential, especially if we're talking about, you know, someone like Magnus Carlsen, who is, you know, destined to go to the very top, uh, you need uh, you need help, you know, like, it's from generation to generation. That's what I learned from Botvinnik, you know, this, it's the way, you know, he looked at the position, the way, you know, he analyzed it. So it, it helps. It's a very general advice. It sounds, you know, trivial. Oh, it's an advice. But, you know, it's, there's, there's always a you know, piece of wisdom. And it helped me that I, I worked with Botvinnik, but I also, you know, was close to other great champions as Boris Spassky and Tigran Petrosian, and I learned. And, uh, and now I, you know, I, I've been doing it for years, you know. I think it's also my duty, you know, just to, uh, to pass this information, to pass this knowledge, this wisdom from... Those, you know, the giants of the past, you know, the, 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 by my great predecessors to those that, that, that are now, you know, just trying to conquer the, the highest peaks of uh, the chess world. So, so you know, just to, uh, to close this off, I want to mention uh, on the political side, you know, this morning, um, obviously, e even though this podcast is going to come out, you know, a few weeks later, uh, this morning there was an explosion in, or maybe two explosions in St. Petersburg. Uh, you came in here, you were getting texts about it. Uh, what's just your, you know, given your, your stance on, on Putin, how does this fit into your, your, st your stance on, on what's going on in Russia right now? Look, uh, what, and we're, Trump seeing, and all what that. we're seeing in Russia now is just, you know, Putin is desperate to stay in power. He knows that, you know, he can't leave Kremlin and retire. So there's, there's too much blood on his hands, too much money has been stolen. So he's the dictator for life. I've been warning for years, uh, more, for, for more than a decade, that eventually Putin will be everybody's problem because when dictator runs out of enemies inside his own country, he goes elsewhere. And that's what Putin did, you know. Now, to stay in power in Russia, he needs to keep, you know, Russian population in fear of, of problems uh, that could, you know, jeopardize their lives. Uh, for them not to realize that he is, you know, so the, the, the main problem that is, is, is preventing uh, them of, of getting decent lives. And uh, uh, Putin, made, uh, Putin has made confrontation with the, with the free world, especially with the United States, as a core element of his domestic propaganda. And uh, for those who believe that, you know, if you make enough concessions to dictator, you know, he'll leave you alone. No, he, he will go everywhere. He will keep creating new uh, hotspots on, on, on the map, you know, new, new problems, you know, after Ukraine, he went to Syria, now he most likely to Libya. He has been interfering in elections across Europe and, of course, in, the, in, in this country because confrontation is what helps him, you know, just to create chaos. And chaos is very important for dictator because he hates united opposition. He hates, you know, strong organizations like NATO, European Union. He wants to divide, which is, again, it's just it's, it's as old as this world, you know, divide and conquer. And he's very good. He's a KGB guy. He's not a military dictator. He's a KGB guy, you know, creating, you know, chaos, creating instability, creating suspicion, you know, blackmailing, bribing. Uh, he has enormous amount of money at his disposal, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that he could, you know, channel one way or another. And he's not shy of buying favors and uh, uh, for politicians, for business people. You know, we heard already comments that if you try to, you know, um, um, undo, you know, Russian uh, um, malicious influence in the financial system in the West, it could, you know, it, it could kill all the markets because there's so much money that is just, you know, in, in different places that, that you know, um, help Putin to uh, promote his clandestine agenda. And of course, we know that KGB, you know, uh, from 50s and 60s, uh, helped different terrorist organizations. Using terror was very much a sort of KGB signature you know, to, to um, uh, promote, uh, uh, promote their, the Soviet agenda at that time. And uh, Putin still has an answer to the very, you know, um, serious accusations of uh, apartment bombing in Russia in 1999 mm -hmm. when, it, you know, he started Second Chechen War 
and it, it paved his, 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 his way to power. So it, is, it created Putin, Putin the fighter of terror, uh, against terror. Putin, um, Putin the, uh, the savior of Russia from, mm. from the Islamic radicals. And uh, all the terrorist attacks we had, you know, at, in, in, from 99 to 2004, uh, what was left at that time of Russian independent media reported that the, you could see a KGB uh, um, uh, traces there. So uh, you could you, you could see the connection. So that this uh, people who were involved, they somehow you know uh, uh, worked worked either with KGB or or, or or had these connections. And as for the explosion in Saint Petersburg today, um, as we're recording it, look. It's a moment where Putin needed some kind of destruction. Again, I'm, I believe in presumption of innocence, though, of course, in, in case of Putin, you know, as many dictators, you know, I think it's, it works the other way. So it's the, it's the, um, the benefit of the doubt, you know, goes, uh, goes against him. Um, but Putin first, uh, first time in many, many years faced a massive demonstrations in Russia in, 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 that involved uh, the new generation. And I think that was a shock for him, you know, with tens of thousands of Russians in marching in the streets. And some people say, you know, what is a ten of tens of thousands? It's a lot because it's not something that, you know, you could do, you know, without any harm for you. So here you can have, you know, a million people marching and police protects you. In Russia, you go on the streets, police is against you. So that's the... Well, you've even been in the streets. I've and, been arrested, and, beaten, you know, yes. spent the time, days in jail. So, but at that time, you know, that was like, you know, this is, it was an easygoing time, quote unquote, because... I could spend five or 10 days in jail today for the same quote unquote crime, just for dist- what they call disturbing public order. You can spend five or 10 years in jail. Mm. So this is in 10 years, you could see, you know, what has happened in Putin's Russia. So that's why I uh, think that it's, it's the, we can, we can suspect that the, uh, the, this attack in St. Petersburg was another product of, of, of KGB because, you know, it helps Putin to promote his agenda in Russia. I believe, you know, soon we'll see, uh, sort of new draconian laws, you know, just uh, uh, limiting what, what what's left of of um, freedom, individual freedom. Uh, I think that they will um, they will impose new security security measures. Also, I think it will help Donald Trump here to uh, uh, sort of. Um, uh, to brush off the uh, Kremlin gate to all these accusations and to start talking again about cooperation with Russia against uh, radical Islamic uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, we don't have any proofs and I, I'm afraid that we'll not find the truth about Putin's crimes as long as he stays in power. So we will not, we'll not find out who actually ordered the murder of Boris Nemtsov, my late uh, um, uh, friend and colleague and ally, one of the most prominent uh, and brave Russian politicians who was murdered uh, 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 two years ago um, in front of Kremlin, Kremlin's gates. Um, but uh, do you ever get worried you're gonna? Um... I live in New York. I mean, it's this, this, this. It was not my first choice, but for four, it's four years. Four years since I left. I left Russia. I live in New York with my family, and uh, you know, people keep asking me, you know. Can you go back to Russia? My answer is yes, I can go back to Russia, but it will be a one-way trip. Right. So, so okay, Deep Thinking by Gary Kasparov. Uh, great book about artificial intelligence plus your personal stories. And, as, and it's how to overcome your fear about artificial intelligence. You know, this is just, you have to treat, right. we have to treat human progress as something inevitable. You know, when, if it's raining, you know, you can complain about it or you can buy an umbrella. You know, it's not a one-dimensional story. This is not, you know, this is nothing linear. You know, this is not, you know, that, oh, you know, I read the book, I read this article and I know everything. This is, again, this is, it's more, it's more psychological. So this is all about us, you know, again, fear, you know, we should not fear science. We should not fear progress. You know, even if it may threaten us directly or indirectly, you know, maybe we can lose a job or maybe we'll not, we're not sure, you know, how we can, you know, advance uh, in some of our endeavors. Look, you know, there's there are always ways, you know. So it's the what's a technique for thinking about how to adapt? Because obviously you've been doing it, but but the, the average person who's who is scared, what do they what do they do? Look, I again, it's the it's it's. I know the the and I actually mentioned in the book the um, the the thought that you know that is even if I lose as an individual, you know, the human race wins, uh, you know, uh, 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 as an as a whole entity. I mean, it's, it's, it, it doesn't warm you up. Right. I understand it. But, um, you know, we, are, we all benefit from progress because, you know, we have all these devices, you know, in our pockets or in our purses, you know, that helps us to, you know, to learn more about the world. You know, 
just think for a moment that we have so much power, you know, in our hands, you know, in just ha- keeping in hand in our palm. It's it's thousand times more than the United States uh, um, had at a time when uh, NASA had when Americans landed on the moon. So with so much power, something can be done. You know, this is, I don't know exactly what you can do, but there's a lot you can do because there's so much power is given to the individual. And it's very important that we are not, you know, wasting these opportunities. We're not complaining. You know, we just, you know, we should be optimistic and we should always overcome our fears. Great. Well, thank you once again, Gary, for for coming in. Deep Thinking by Gary Kasparov. It was a great book and also was a big reminder for me because I just remember being in the audience watching. And I, and I, and again, I remember... 1989, when Feng Shui was building the predecessor to Deep Blue, I it's was there. Mentioned, so. It's mentioned in the, in, in the book also. You know, Deep just... Thought, 1989, I remember it well. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey there. I just want to let you know Not only do I have new episodes for you every Tuesday, but I'm considering adding episodes to each week. But I really want to know if you like the show. And there's an easy way for you to tell me. If you subscribe, you'll never miss a single show. And it's really easy to do this, and it helps me a lot. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Thanks. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.